I was just thinking how it, sometimes it can be very hard to lift him up on high when you've been brought down very low during the week. Some of you, you've had a very long week. You've had challenge after challenge, trial after trial. But you see, to lift him up on high is to know in faith that when Jesus went to the cross and died for all of our sins, he rose again on the third day. And every day that I get to live, I have resurrection life. So man, and listen, your job and all that you're facing can only bring you low but so far. Only but so far. Because there's a faith that rises up in the heart of every believer knowing in the power of the Holy Spirit that we have been called to be a generation that is able to walk on water despite the winds and the waves. There is a generation that rises up whose eyes are on King Jesus and we know without a doubt that the one who is lifted up is the one who's going to hold me up. The one who has lifted me up is the one who breaks the chains of despair and addiction. The one who I lift up is the one who is going to take me home one day. The one who I lift up is the one who has answered all of my problems. The one who I lift up is a miracle worker. And because of him, I'm standing here today. Hey, hey church, he's brought you too far to let you go now. You hear what I'm saying? For those of you who might be here today, and here's what you're thinking, I can't take any more. God has been faithful. You're here today, and he's brought you too far to let you go now. That's why we lift him up. He's good. He's faithful. He's worthy. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity for us to come and to gather together and to worship and to praise your name, your holy name, powerful name, Jesus. Lord, I pray right now, God, that every weary heart would find rest. I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would move upon every weary soul like living water. I pray in the name of Jesus that hearts would be transformed this afternoon. Oh God, I pray that the unbeliever would believe, that the faithless would find faith, that the one who is hopeless would rest now in the presence of Jesus and recognize that our hope is in you and in you alone. Lord, I come against demonic strongholds right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I, I sense it and I feel it that Lord God, by the power that you have given your people, we call on your great name, Jesus. And we believe that every demon has to flee when we call on the name of Jesus Christ. So God, I come against every demonic stronghold right now. I come against every wicked spirit that tries to hold back the people of God. And I ask right now that as we lift up your name, that Lord God, that you would put your foot on the head of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. I ask right now, oh Lord God, that your people would be set free right now here in your sanctuary. In the name of Jesus, I pray. In your name, Jesus. In your name, Jesus. In your name, Jesus. Oh God, I pray that we would be a people who call on that great name, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. Lord God, I pray right now that we would be unashamed to call on the name Jesus. Lord, I pray right now, set the captives free in the name of Jesus. Set the captives free. Jesus, bring your people into perfect peace right 
now, oh God. Jesus, bring your people into perfect peace. Oh, come on, you just lift up your voice right now and call on that name, Jesus. You put his name, you put his name on it right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. In the name of Jesus. 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 Oh, Lord God, I pray that you would stir in our souls a cry, a cry for your Lord, a cry for your presence, a cry in the name of Jesus, a cry in the name of Jesus.
John chapter 12, John chapter 12. Let me start by reading the first three verses of John chapter 12. Beginning with verse one, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany 
where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Verse 3, Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The message is titled, The Fragrance of Worship. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for our time of worship. I thank you, Lord God, for how you have met us. I thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, I ask now that you would finish what you have started already in our hearts this afternoon. Lord, I pray that every heart would submit to your word. Beginning with me, I yield to your word. And may your word come alive to every person that's here gathered in this sanctuary this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 1, six days before the Passover. Now this is, uh, you know, uh, here in this moment, the Passover was often a celebration of Israel being set free from bondage in Egypt. But what they didn't realize is they were getting ready to be set free from the bondage of sin forevermore through the finished work of Jesus. And so as Jesus comes into Bethany, he stays at, with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary of Bethany. And, and they gave a dinner for him in verse 2 as we just read. And, and this is a family who is very close to Jesus. And Jesus visits them regularly. They're friends of Christ. And I believe that their friendship represents Christ's desire to know you and I as friend. Not only are we saved by Christ crucified, but we are invited to be in communion with Christ. We are invited to be in relationship with Christ. We're invited to be in friendship with Christ. Now, Mary took this pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Listen, Mary's expensive ointment is a type of essential oil. It was a distinct aroma that held strong to the skin and hair. The aroma was an indication that the very best had been offered. In the Song of Solomon, this same ointment is mentioned in reference to the love between the bride and the groom. Song of Solomon, verse, chapter 1, verse 12. The bride says... While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. Church, the world wants to sell you and I a lot of different fragrances, and many are attractive. But it must only be the fragrance of worship that exudes from the bride of Christ. The fragrance of worship is only as strong as the formula. The formula is in the relationship between Christ and his body. Christ and his body represents spirit and truth. That's the formula for the fragrance of worship. I often say we worship in spirit and in truth. It's the power of the Holy Spirit revealed to us through Christ and the finished work of the cross. And you and I as the body have to step into that truth and when we do there's a perfect formula for the fragrance of worship the relationship is held together by the one who loved us first first john chapter 4 verse 19 we love because he first loved us hey church there's a fragrance of worship that is rising up here at soul cry we felt it. We sensed it. This very moment, this hour, we leaned into it. It is cultivated out of love for Christ and for one another. 
out of our love for Christ and love for one another. It is our commitment to use our resources, devote our time and energy, giving of ourselves fully to the work of the gospel and to glorify Christ with all that we have. The fragrance of worship represents you and I on bended knee at the feet of Jesus, fully surrendered. That is to truly pour out our oil. And it's all for his glory. Hey, Mary pours out her oil on the feet of Jesus, not sparing any for anything else or any other. Sometimes we pour out our oil on things and people that do not align to God's will for your life. Nothing and no one should be raised up and glorified above the name of Jesus. Hey, be careful how you spend your time and energy in the pursuits of life. For too long, the wrong pursuits have consumed our hearts and ultimately crippling our hearts. It's the pursuit of holiness that heals the heart and fulfills the soul. Remember, all that we pursue here on earth will not last. So stop giving your best to something that's already has a time limit. Your best goes to God. Your best is your praise to King Jesus. Your best belongs to him. If you think about it, it's fair. Heavenly Father, our Father, gave us his best so that you and I might have life today. He gave of himself. So why do we give God seconds why do we give, the, give God the leftovers and give this world everything that represents our best? When God gave us his only begotten son to come and die for us so that we might have life. You see, if we fully understand the beauty of this gospel, we would know without a doubt that our best must always be reserved for the work of the Lord and for the glory of his name. This is why I spend my life always telling people about the goodness of Jesus Christ. My best is my witness. Your best is your witness for the glory of King Jesus. There should never be really any day that goes by without you expressing Christ as King for his glory. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> Listen, it, but Judas Iscariot in verse four, go with me. But Judas Iscariot, in verse 4, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, in verse 5, you with me, say amen. <laughs> Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Verse 6, he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charged the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Wow. Scandalous. Your boy was a thief. He said this not, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Look at verse 6. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. You see, the motives behind what he said was to simply gratify himself and continue stealing money. The ointment that Mary used was worth a year's wages. Judas said what sounded right, but his heart posture was wrong, deceitful, and wicked. I know some of us know some people who are very good at saying what sounds right, but their hot heart posture is completely wrong, deceitful, and wicked. And Jesus knew that his heart posture was wrong. John chapter 2, verse 24 to 25. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. There are times we all struggle to understand. If Jesus knows already the evil that is taking place, why doesn't he do something about it? Why does he allow Judas to steal from them? Why would Jesus even allow Judas to hold the money back? 
You see, we've all faced darkness and evil, and we've all wondered, when will God intervene? When will God put a stop to evil? When will he finally stop allowing that person who hurt me to hurt others? And we find ourselves sometimes waiting for God to bring the hammer down on that individual that you can think about right now. We, we, we go to Instagram and we look to see if their Instagram page has been shut down. Or have they finally disappeared or fallen off the map? Stop going to that person's Instagram page. You spend more time waiting for that individual's punishment rather than focusing on the promise that God has for you. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 4 says, the Lord has prepared everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of disaster. That's for God to decide, not you. Even though you've prayed for the moment to happen for a long time. But that's none of your business. Proverbs 16 verse 5. Everyone with a proud heart is detestable to the Lord. Scripture is really referring to the proud heart that attempts to rise above the will of God, rejecting salvation in Christ. That is that. That is detestable to the Lord. Be assured, church, that individual will not go unpunished. But do not waste time focusing on when the punishment will be administered. Focus on Jesus and give God glory. Psalm 68, 19 says this, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, our savior for each day. He carries us in his arms. Our God is a God who saves the sovereign Lord rescues us from death. Going back here to our main text. Jesus said, Jesus says this to Judas, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Look at verse eight, you with me say amen. amen. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And Jesus was not dismissing ministry to the poor. He makes it very clear in scripture to care for the poor, the widow and the orphan, but all that we do must be anchored in our commitment to keep him first priority in our lives. It's from a healthy place in communion with Christ that we receive our calling to serve. I'll say that again. It's from a healthy place in communion with Christ that we receive our calling to serve. In other words, you don't get healthy by doing more. You get healthy by dwelling in his presence. You hearing me? You don't get healthy by doing more. You get healthy by dwelling in his presence. That was Martha's problem the first time Jesus came to the house in Luke chapter 10. Martha was distracted. You see, we're reading right here in John chapter 12 that Martha was serving. But in Luke chapter 10, it's a different moment when Jesus shows up to have dinner with three of his friends. I don't know if you all remember Luke chapter 10, but Jesus shows up and scripture begins within that story to let us know very clearly that Martha was distracted with much serving, which means sometimes your efforts to do for God are sometimes a distraction when God just wants you to sit. You, you need to understand, you dwell first before you do. It's not the opposite. You dwell first, then you do. Not do first, second dwell. No, dwell first, do second. Because if you never dwell first, then you'll always find yourself doing in the effort to affirm what should have been already validated in the presence of God. 
This is why in Luke chapter 10, we get this moment with Martha. Martha, you are distracted with much serving. And this is why we have that moment in Luke chapter 10 when Martha gets to the point where she comes to Jesus and she starts pointing her finger at her sister. Because when you are distracted with much serving and you really need to sit, sit down, you find yourself pointing at other people so that you can't, so that you don't have to focus on the stuff that you're dealing with. So she's distracted with much serving, and she says to Jesus, hey, tell my sister to get up and get in the kitchen. But really, Mary was in the right position. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. And Jesus says this to Martha. Martha, Martha, when he says your name twice, that means you're in trouble. <laughs> Martha, <clears throat> Martha. You are, you're anxious. You're, you're dealing with worry. Oh, and then Jesus goes on to say something else. You're actually troubled about not just a few things. You're troubled about many things. Hey, Martha, one thing is necessary. It's me, the good portion. You see, keep that in mind in Luke chapter 10. That when Martha was serving, it was a distraction. Keep it in mind, in Luke chapter 10, that when Martha was serving, it was a distraction. Martha was anxious. Martha was worried. Martha had a lot of things on her mind. And the only way you're going to be able to work through those troubles is not to do, but to dwell. To dwell. But Martha didn't understand that in Luke chapter 10. Look. We go on in verse 9 of John chapter 12. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. The chief priests representing religious hate, religious bondage, religious pride, Religious evil, the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. They're still in verse 11 talking about Lazarus, the one who was raised up from the dead. You see, resurrection life ruffles the feathers of religious evil. Religious evil is threatening Lazarus' life, but his story is changing lives. Satan wants to silence your story of resurrection life, but the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And hello, somebody, you and I are the church. And we've been given the victory through Christ. We've been called to be a testimony of Christ. And we are to declare the glory of Christ. But remember, you can never be truly a witness of Christ until you understand what it is that God has called you to do. But to do must first require dwelling in his presence. This is why we always talk about the importance of you and I staying in the word of God. This is why you and I have to continue to cultivate a prayer life. To understand what it looks like to be in communion with King Jesus each and every day. To dwell, to dwell, to dwell is to know King Jesus intimately. To dwell is to know King Jesus in the fullness of who he is. Can we look at Revelation chapter 21? I told you all this year we're going to keep bouncing around into the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, look at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. You know what that tells me? Something good is really coming. Next verse. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. That's so beautiful. Listen, what, what we are going to experience one day is not going to be what is built up from the ground by man, but it's going to come from heaven out of the hand of God. Who is it for? For his bride. Who is the bride? You and I as the church. 
Man, I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. That new life that we're going to live, it's coming, it's coming from, from up here. If it comes from up here, you best believe it looks far better than what came up out of this dust. And it's for his bride. It's prepared for the bride. Who's the bride? It's the church. I need you all to understand this. You and I are the bride of Christ. Next verse. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, what? Everyone read it with me. The dwelling place of God is with man. Stop right there. You want to know what the end looks like? It's God dwelling with man. It's God dwelling with man. You want to know what the end looks like? It's not you doing more. It's you dwelling with him. Because we've lived our lives for so long, always attempting to do in the effort to finally feel like we have settled. But I don't need to settle in, in, in a way where it's based on my doing. My settling is found in just simply knowing that the end result will be me dwelling with King Jesus. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. Ready? And God himself will be with them as their, their God. Church, we've been called to dwell. Verse four, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hallelujah. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. You see, death is swallowed up in victory. The victory won for us on the cross. Christ defeated sin, death, and the grave. Mary of Bethany knew this in John chapter 12. Mary of Bethany knew this in John chapter 12 after she witnessed resurrection power in John chapter 11. Oh, stay with me. Death is swallowed up in victory, won for us through Christ who defeated sin death, and the grave. That's our revelation. But I want you to understand that Mary of Bethany knew this in John chapter 12 when she poured out her oil on the feet of Jesus. She knew that who she was worshiping in that moment is the Savior the one who has the power and authority over sin and death. She knew it in John chapter 12 because she experienced it in John chapter 11. Scripture reveals to us that Mary of Bethany was at the feet of Jesus, not just once, not just twice, but three times she was at the feet of Jesus. Gary, could you come up here, please? I'm going to take some time and y'all need to understand. I'm going to give you a clear picture of the victory that we are allowed to step into. And I want you to understand the beauty of the fragrance of worship that God has given us as his people but you need to find it here right now with Mary of Bethany we started out with John chapter 12 I started at the end instead of starting at the beginning because if you were to go back to the beginning you would get a one-liner that comes from Mary of Bethany Bethany didn't say much round two and three she didn't need to say much. She didn't need to do much. She just needed to dwell. Because the first time that she found herself at the feet of Jesus, she was grieving in sorrow. Y'all need to stick with me on this. That's Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha of Bethany welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary. I'm sorry. Look, look at John chapter 11, verse 32. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. 
saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's John chapter 11, verse 32. That's actually supposed to be the first moment that they are revealed as friends of Jesus. It is her moment at the feet of Jesus in grief, in sorrow, a cry for healing, a cry for hope. And she's at the feet of Jesus. And immediately after she cries out in grief and in sorrow, scripture makes it clear that he weeps. And then he steps up to the grave and he calls Lazarus out of the grave. And even Martha tried to stop him and say, whoa, 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 hold on. You, you, you can't do that. Don't, don't, op- don't, op- don't open it. There's going to be an odor. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And your boy Lazarus, completely wrapped from head to toe. I imagine him shuffling out. Out of the grave. Out of the grave. Lazarus was in there for four days. And Jesus calls him out of the grave. Remember, all time is in his hands. It's not a matter of when. It's not a matter of how. It's a matter of you and I just trusting him at his word. After Mary cries out at the feet of Jesus, as we just read in John chapter 11, we don't hear much more from Mary because for the remainder of her time with him, it's about simply receiving. It's about simply serving. Now that I have dwelled with him, I can now serve in a better position. You see, Here's the second time. That's Luke 10. That's what we read and talked about a little earlier. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Now she's just, now she's at the feet of Jesus just to simply listen. You will never get revelation just doing. Revelation happens when you dwell. The greatest revelation that you will receive from God is when you simply dwell in his presence. It's being in communion with him. It's being in friendship with him. It's being in relationship with him. Don't allow your doing to become a distraction from the revelation that God desires to give to you. Then there's John chapter 12. At the feet of Jesus, She worships. She worships and she pours her oil out at the feet of Jesus. She worships him as Messiah. Messiah meaning the anointed one. You see, I believe that after three beautiful moments of being at the feet of Jesus, It was enough for Mary of Bethany to know without a doubt in faith that I serve the Savior, the Messiah, the anointed one who is to lay down his life so that we might live. I believe, and I did some study. I took some time, did a deep dive, even last night, just a deep dive going through commentary. And I realized something Mary of Bethany didn't show up at the grave. When Jesus died on the cross, Mary wasn't there. Hey, you can search. I did my searching already. There were some Marys there. It was Mary, 
the mother of Jesus, mama gonna be there. Mama was at the cross. Mama was three days later at the grave. There was Mary Magdalene. She showed up three days later after Jesus died and was right there. She saw a lot go down. She was so wild in that moment that she saw Jesus. She just thought it was the gardener. There was another woman named Salome who was there. There was another woman named Joanna that was there. But there was no Mary of Bethany and there was no Martha of Bethany. Here's what I can only simply believe in as I recognize that two of his closest friends were not at the grave. I believe that they were waiting for him to come on back to Bethany. You want to know why? Because they had already witnessed and experienced his resurrection power. They were already walking in communion with King Jesus. When you dwell, you know. When you dwell, you know. We don't need to go to the grave. Besides, it's just been three days. And if he wants to come back to life on the fourth day, that's fine. Fifth, sixth, seventh day, that's fine. But it's not a matter of the days. It's just a matter of when he will rise again. Mary of Bethany, at the feet of Jesus, grieving crying out Mary of Bethany at the feet of Jesus listening receiving I believe that she received the revelation at the feet of Jesus that my Savior will rise again on the third day Mary at the feet of Jesus oh. she pours out her oil she pours out her oil on the feet of Jesus and she wipes his feet with her hair. Uh, Zechariah 14.4 A prophetic word is given to us from the prophet. Everybody look up. On that day his feet, the feet of King Jesus. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. This is a prophetic word of the return, speaking of the return of King Jesus who will establish himself on the hilltop. And if Jesus is to establish himself on the hill, then that means you and I will be that light, a city set on a hill because we are his body. We are an extension of King Jesus. And oh, how good it is that we would recognize his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Oh, guess what? Guess where the Mount of Olives is? Bethany. The Mount of Olives is at Bethany. That place represents resurrection life. That place that lies before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. Let me tell you something. Also, this is also a revelation, a prophetic revelation that reveals to us as a church that we've been called to expand. The God who splits the mountain, the God of the hills and the valleys, the God who desires that you and I as his church should bear witness to him throughout all the world. I love how this, simple, this verse gives us a clear understanding that God never settles for the norm. He's always expanding, always creating, always stretching his people, always moving us forward always establishing his name on hilltops and valleys. And I believe that God is calling us to a church to move with him when he calls us to move. We said it from the very beginning when we launched that first Sunday in May in 2022, we're going to stay under the cloud. 
And wherever the cloud moves, that's where we go. The cloud represents his glory. The cloud represents his name. And may we all fall in line and follow in his footprints as he continues to lead us. But first, before we can do, we must dwell at the feet of Jesus. Before you can finally come to a place where you're really serving with an open heart, where you're able to serve in perfect peace, you've got to dwell in his presence or else it's just a distraction. God forbid that we become a church that serves, but we're distracted, we're anxious, and we're troubled about many things. God forbid. God forbid. So many have come to this church because wherever you were maybe before, you found yourself in the kitchen a little bit too long. Uh-huh. Some of you came in here burnt out and tired because you've been cooking, 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 and you have forgotten what it looks like to simply rest in the presence of Jesus. I don't want anyone here to come to a place where you serve, 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 do, 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 and, you, and, and now you've lost the beauty of just dwelling in his presence. Martha was distracted with serving and she really found herself in this place of anxiety and worry. Why? Because she was always trying to prove her worth and her value. Well, we do that sometimes. We find ourselves in the kitchen and we hope that we can cook up something so nice that when we step back into the room where everyone else is dwelling, we hope that the attention will be on us and suddenly get that validation and that affirmation that we've been craving for. But what if you and I find ourselves in the kitchen like Martha cooking up something that God didn't even order? Because that's what happens when you don't dwell with King Jesus. You start creating your own menu rather than understanding the recipe that God has already established in his presence at his feet. And I've seen a lot of people serve for years and years and years and still find themselves not fulfilled. What if you've been doing something that God's never called you to do? Oh God. God. Bring your people to a place of rest. Can I, can I just say this? I like to dwell. It's my favorite thing to do. And uh, Duran, Monday's on my Sabbath. Monday's on my Sabbath, y'all. Don't, don't mess with me on Monday. I am dwelling. I, I, I have to. I have to. I have to dwell and rest in his presence. Because there's so much more that he can do for you than you can do for him. There's so much more that he has for you. Far more in comparison to what you can do for him. Today, would you dwell? It's in the dwelling. It's in the dwelling. Would you stand up with me?